now that we've covered the statement of Eisenstein's criterion, and you may or may not have chosen to watch the proof of that, what I really want to do is talk about some examples of Eisenstein's criterion. So the first thing we're going to do is a nice, easy application of Eisenstein. Let's look at the polynomial f of x. Let's make it interesting. Let's make it x to the 101st power plus 8x to the 11 plus 20x to the 5th plus 6. Now this is not a polynomial that I would want to toy around with trying to factor. And just because I couldn't come up with a factorization of it by hand would not mean that it's irreducible. It might just be that I'm not clever enough to see what the factorization is, especially with all the canceling I could have going on if I were trying to factor something like x to the 101st. So luckily, this is a perfect example of a polynomial where we can apply Eisenstein's criterion. Now, remember what Eisenstein's criterion says. It says I need to find some sort of prime number. Just finding just one will be fine. That prime number cannot divide the leading coefficient of the polynomial. Here, our leading coefficient is 1, so that's going to be fine. Any prime we pick under the sun is not going to divide 1. The next thing I need is for that prime to divide all of the coefficients of the remaining terms. So my remaining terms here are 8, 20, and 6. So I'm looking for a prime that divides all three of those. And I can find a prime that works there. Prime 2 is going to work. And the last thing I need for Eisenstein's criterion is I need that the square of that prime, which here is 4 if I stick with the prime 2, I need that not to divide the constant term. Here the constant term is 6, so no problem. So we see that this polynomial f of x passes Eisenstein's test with respect to the prime 2. However, it would fail the test with respect to lots of other primes. For instance, if I took the prime 3, the prime 3 satisfies the first condition for Eisenstein's test. It does not divide the leading coefficient. It satisfies the third term, as 3 squared does not divide the constant term, 6. 9 does not divide 6 here, so we would pass that last term, uh, that last item of the test. But 3 does not divide 8, and 3 does not divide 20, so we're going to fail that second criterion uh, inside of Eisenstein's test. So we see that it doesn't have to work for every prime. You know, it doesn't have to work for 3 or 5 or all of the primes. We only need to find one prime, and we can apply Eisenstein's test, which is really nice. Makes it a little bit more of a useful tool. However, the, thing that, the next thing that I want to point out is, is don't get too excited about Eisenstein's criterion. It's really cool. It's awesome. We're going to see some great applications of it. But the story doesn't end with Eisenstein's criterion, um, or we wouldn't be studying it now. For instance, the polynomial x squared plus 4 fails Eisenstein's test with respect to every prime. So let's walk through that. Um, I'm not going to have any trouble satisfying the first condition. The leading coefficient of this polynomial x squared plus 4 is 1. So every single prime is not going to divide the leading coefficient, so no problems there. I don't even run into sec problems with the second criterion. What I need then is a prime that divides all of the remaining coefficients in the polynomial. Here there's only one, that's the number 4, so no problems there. I can pick the prime 2. The prime 2 will divide all the remaining um, coefficients on the polynomial. Where I'm going to run into problems is with that third criterion on the test, that 2 squared, which is 4, does in fact divide the constant term. And so I'm going to run into problems at that last condition in Eisenstein's test, and I'm not going to be able to use Eisenstein's criterion to conclude that x squared plus 4 is irreducible. However, it definitely is. That is an irreducible polynomial over the rational numbers. And so I have examples of irreducible polynomials that aren't going to be detectable by Eisenstein's criterion. Uh, so we're going to have to be, you know, the story with irreducibility does not end with Eisenstein, although Eisenstein does help us pick out some good examples of irreducible polynomials, like the first example that we have here. However, don't disregard Eisenstein's criterion just yet. It's still a really cool theorem. And to show you why I think it's so cool, I want to show you a really nice corollary of Eisenstein's theorem. Um, what's good about this corollary is that it's, it's really important in many ways. First of all, the statement of the corollary is useful and important to us. Um, hopefully later on in the course, we'll study what are called the cyclotomic polynomials in a little more detail. So, this corollary is talking about the cyclotomic polynomials. It's a good introduction. However, the proof of the theorem is equally important. The proof of this corollary 
is useful, we're going to go through it and it's got a really nice trick in it um, that I'm going to expect you to be able to duplicate. So let's get into it now. Let's see, what is the statement of the corollary? So for every prime number p, the so-called pth cyclotomic polynomial, which we denote by phi sub p of x, is irreducible over the rational numbers. That's the statement of the corollary. Now let's go back and let's define the pth cyclotomic polynomial. So we denote it by phi sub p. What it is, is you start with the polynomial, x raised to the p power, and then you subtract 1. That polynomial has an obvious root. When I take 1 to the pth power and subtract 1, I'm going to obviously get 0. So when I divide through by that obvious root, x minus 1, what's left is the pth cyclotomic polynomial. And what's left is the polynomial x raised to the p minus first plus x raised to the p minus second plus x raised to the p minus third, and so on and so forth all the way down to plus x plus 1. So for example, phi sub 3 of x would be the polynomial x squared plus x plus 1, and phi sub 5 of x, 5 is another perfectly good prime, that's the polynomial x to the fourth plus x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1. And each of those polynomials, no matter what the p is, is automatically irreducible over the rational numbers. And we can prove this using Eisenstein's criterion. Now, what I hope is happening on the other end of the computer screen is I hope you're sitting there a little stumped, and I hope you're saying, how on earth can I apply Eisenstein's criterion to a polynomial that looks like this? Every single coefficient here is 1. Right? So I'm not going to run into any trouble with the first condition of Eisenstein's criterion, Every prime I could possibly pick will not divide the leading coefficient, but then that's exactly the problem. The leading coefficient is the same as all the other coefficients. They're all 1. How am I going to satisfy the second or the third condition of Eisenstein's criterion? Uh, and that's why the proof of this is so cool, is the proof of this comes up with a way to very cleverly use Eisenstein's criterion to something else uh, to help us figure out that this polynomial is irreducible. So let's get into that proof. I'm going to give it all away in the first line here. This is the trick, and this is what I want you to be able to duplicate. The trick here is to take phi sub p, the cyclotomic, the pth cyclotomic polynomial, and the trick is to not evaluate it at x. The trick is to evaluate the polynomial at x plus 1, or to evaluate it more generally, to evaluate a polynomial at some sort of shift of the function some sort of uh, horizontal shift of the function. Yep. When we take phi sub p and we evaluate it at x plus 1, what we do is we go up to the formula for what phi sub p is. Let's go to the first part of that formula, the fractional part, and everywhere we see an x, let's just sub in x plus 1. So we're left with x plus 1 raised to the pth power, and we want to subtract 1 from that, and when we're done, we want to divide it all by x plus 1 minus 1. The rest of this proof you know, I've already stated what the big trick to this proof is. Once that trick is in hand, the rest of the proof is just simplification. So when I simplify, I like to start with the simplest things. So if I take a look at that denominator, x plus 1 minus 1, that simplifies to x. That part's easy. What we need to do now is go back to the numerator and see if we can simplify the numerator a little bit. The way we're going to do that is just by using the binomial theorem. That is, we're going to go back and we're going to try to cleverly remember how to take something of the form quantity a plus b raised to the nth power. We're going to use uh, binomials and choose k's, and we're going to tell you a formula for what that a plus b raised to the nth power is, and we're applying that with the quantity x plus 1 raised to the pth power. So according to the binomial theorem, when I take that x plus 1, I raise it to the pth power, and I expand that all out, I get x to the p plus p choose 1, x to the p minus 1. The next term would be p choose 2 times x to the p minus 2, and I continue, so on and so forth, until I get p choose p minus 1 times x, and then the last term in that expansion is just plus 1. Now I still have this minus 1 lingering around, and so the next term, the next thing I'm going to do in terms of simplifying this is I'm going to take the plus 1 that comes from the x plus 1 raised to the pth power, that I have, and I'm going to take this minus 1 I'm subtracting off, and I'm going to cancel those two things. Okay. And that's all that's left of the numerator. Now what's left in the numerator, everything has at least one copy of x in it. And remember, 
back in this fraction, I wanted to just divide everything by x. So all I'm left with is this collection of terms right here in the numerator. Then what I want to do is divide everything by x. And the effect that's going to have is it's just going to lower the degree of everything that I'm looking at by 1. Now, let's write down what that is. After I do that simplification, phi sub p of x plus 1 is equal to, now my leading term is x raised to the p minus 1, and then I'm left with p choose 1 times x to the p minus 2, plus so on and so forth. The coefficient on the x is going to be p choose p minus 2, and the constant term that I'm going to be left with is what was formerly the coefficient on x on the previous page, just that p choose p minus 1. Now, here's why this is really wonderful. The leading coefficient of phi sub p when I've evaluated at x plus 1 is still 1, so I'm still going to very easily satisfy that first condition of Eisenstein's criterion. However, every other term that I'm looking at, the coefficients on the x to the p minus 2 down to the x plus the constant term, all of those co coefficients now look like something of the form p choose k, where k is just some number strictly in between 0 and p, or in other words, k could be equal to 1 but is less than or equal to p minus 1. That is, every other coefficient in this expansion other than that leading coefficient is divisible by p. This is a fact that I've used once before in one of the previous uh, videos earlier on in the slides, uh, something that I prove in my Abstract Algebra 1 class, and this is where I'm really using the fact that p is a prime number. So for instance, this constant term, which is p choose p minus 1, that's the same thing as p choose 1, and p choose 1 is just p. So that's what the constant term is. That's also what the p choose 1 term is. That's also just p. And then all of the other coefficients in the expansion are going to be divisible by the prime p. So that means that the first term of Eisenstein's theorem is, that first item on Eisenstein's theorem is satisfied. There aren't any primes dividing the leading coefficient. And the prime p is going to divide all of the remaining terms that I have. So if I'm sticking with the prime p, I've now satisfied the first two things for Eisenstein's criterion. Lastly, going back to that constant term, the constant term is p choose 1, which is p. And that's not divisible by p squared. And that is the last condition that we need in order to satisfy Eisenstein's criterion. And what we've proved by just taking phi sub p and evaluating it at x plus 1 is we've proved that the polynomial phi sub p of x plus 1 is irreducible, and we did that using Eisenstein's theorem. However, this is going to give us what we want about the polynomial phi sub p of x. Right? Remember, phi sub p of x is the polynomial we're interested in. What we did is we just proved that phi sub p of x plus 1 is irreducible. However, this is going to be enough to tell us that the polynomial phi sub p of x is, is irreducible. Right? If phi sub p of x were reducible, say we could take phi sub p and write it as g of x times h of x, then all I'd have to do is plug in x plus 1 on both sides of that equation, and I would get that phi sub p of x plus 1 factors as g of x plus 1 times h of x plus 1. The degrees of those polynomials is going to be the same as the degrees of g and h, so a reduction of phi sub p would automatically imply that phi sub p of x plus 1 has a reduction, and that's a contradiction to what we just proved. So, in fact, proving that phi sub p of x plus 1 is irreducible is enough to conclude that phi sub p of x is irreducible, and we get what we want. So, all in all, really cool way to use Eisenstein's criterion. Before we end this sequence of videos, however, I want to talk about one more irreducibility test. Um, so this is what's called the mod p irreducibility test, and this is the theorem. Again, let's suppose that p is a prime number, and let's let f of x be a polynomial uh, with integer coefficients, and let's let it be a non-constant polynomial. So an interesting polynomial, something with degree 1 or higher. Then let's suppose that g of x is a polynomial in z mod p of x, uh, same prime p, 
And let's let it not just be an arbitrary polynomial, let's let it be the polynomial obtained by just reducing the coefficients of the polynomial f modulo p. Much more natural than it sounds when you write it with that formality. If it happens to be the case that g of x is irreducible and z mod p adjoined x, and if the polynomials f and g have the same degree, then what we can do is conclude that the original polynomial f is irreducible over the rational numbers. Okay. Again, this test sounds a little bit like a mouthful when you say the theorem, but it's really nice to and easy to apply in practice. And here's something cool about it. We saw before that Eisenstein's criterion could not be used to show irreducibility for the polynomial x squared plus 4. However, we can use the mod p irreducibility test to show that this polynomial is irreducible. For instance, if we take the prime p is equal to 3, a perfectly good prime, we take x squared plus 4, that's our polynomial f of x, and let's, here we've now fixed our prime p to be 3, g of x is the polynomial that's just x squared plus 4, where we take and read the coefficients modulo 3. So that g of x turns into x squared plus 1. This is a polynomial of degree 2. We're now working over a finite field. We can test to see if it's irreducible by just checking the numbers 0, 1, and 2 and making sure that they aren't a root of g of x. Right? So if I, I dare not try modular arithmetic again, but if I plug in 0, 1, or 2, I never get 0 for g of x. And so by some of the things we've seen earlier, that means that g of x is irreducible. Um, in z mod 3 adjoined x. Because of the fact that I didn't lower the degree of the polynomial f of x when I reduced modulo 3, right, f of x and g of x have the same degree, I can use this theorem to conclude that the original polynomial x squared plus 4 is irreducible over the rational numbers. So pretty cool, pretty cool thing going on with this mod p irreducibility test. We can take things that were not finite before and switch into working the finite fields, which has the distinct advantage of letting us do fewer computations. Um, two things that I want to point out that are little subtleties about this. First of all, um, don't do something silly and reduce the exponents by p as well. That wouldn't have, you wouldn't have noticed that necessarily in this example because 2 is 2 mod 3. But what I, if I had something of the form like x to the fourth plus 4, what I would not want to do is reduce that to x plus 1. That would be incorrect. I don't want to reduce the, the power on um, the polynomials. I would want to reduce x to the fourth plus 4. The proper way to reduce that modulo 3 would be x to the fourth plus 1, not x plus 1. Um, However, there is something that I want to say. Again, the mod p irreducibility test is not the be-all, end-all. None of these tests are. They're only ever going to detect a certain amount of irreducible polynomials. Right? So although we were able to take a polynomial like x squared plus 4, where we couldn't apply Eisenstein's test to x squared plus 4, we can apply the mod p irreducibility test to x squared plus 4 to prove that it's irreducible. So, there are some irreducible polynomials that you're not going to pick up by Eisenstein's test that you can pick up by the mod p irreducibility test. And it goes the other way around too. Um, this is something that I would have you work through in the worksheet. This is a little bit harder, but there are polynomials that are irreducible that you cannot determine their, irreduci their irreducibility using the mod p irreducibility test for any prime p. However, you can pick them up with Eisenstein's criterion. So it's not that one test is better than the other. It's not that I never have to use Eisenstein's test and I could always use the mod p irreducibility test, nor is it the other way around. But there are some polynomials that Eisenstein will pick up that mod p won't, and there are some polynomials that mod p will pick up that Eisenstein won't. And worse than that, even yet, which I think is something that I have you working on on the worksheet, is that there are irreducible polynomials that aren't going to be picked up by either method. So Eisenstein will never work and neither will this test. Uh, again, it's what keeps the subject interesting, it's what keeps us working in this area of, of research. Um, 
So what have I outlined here? I said the polynomial, I've just given you one particular example, and I've given you a different example on your worksheet. But if we start with the polynomial f of x, which is x to the fourth plus one, uh, this happens to be reducible mod p for all primes p. Showing that is a little tricky. Um, Galleon does it, it, it's an exercise in his book, and he gives some hints in the back of the book. I've also given you a worksheet with a different polynomial that has the same property, that it's reducible mod p for all primes p, and I've walked you through a proof of that. Um, however, the polynomial x to the fourth plus one is irreducible over the rational numbers. So it's irreducible, but you're never going to figure that out trying to use this test. Uh, however, for this particular polynomial, x to the fourth plus one, you could apply Eisenstein's criterion to the polynomial f of x plus one. And that I've left to you as an exercise. That part is easy to show. If you take a look at f of the quantity x plus one, you can apply Eisenstein to that polynomial to get the irreducibility of this particular polynomial. However, you cannot prove it with the mod p irreducibility test. Um, the example, so that's what the difference is. On your worksheet that I'm gonna have you taking a look at, I've given you a different polynomial that you can apply neither test to. So it will fail Eisenstein's test all the time, and it will also fail mod p irreducibility all the time, yet it happens to be an irreducible polynomial.